Welcome to Progressive Soup. My name is Roberto Perez. I am filling in for our illustrious captain, David Stevenson, but he's here in spirit. With me uh, right now is Cora Santaguido and Ralph Maurer and our mainstay, Joan Iola, my mentor. Uh, the last show we spoke of the enormous debt that's been incurred for our college uh, graduates, their student loan, the debt is enormous. And Ms. Stein hopefully has the right solution. Cora, elaborate for us uh, on the uh, issue. Well, um, as far as student debt uh, goes, um, you know, she is looking to eliminate student debt as where other candidates may say, okay, lower the interest rates. She actually wants to <coughs> eliminate it completely. And, uh, you know, some people are saying, well, how could that be done? Mm -hmm. um, and the way that Wall Street bailouts happened was through uh, quantitative easing. And uh, that is something that uh, Jill Stein thinks would be a solution um, to, uh, you know, to get these debts forgiven completely. Um, so, and really, it's through the Federal Reserve. Am I correct? It's yeah, it would require the Federal Reserve having the Treasury expand the, the money supply, print up the money to pay off the debt. So in essence, what you would have that since the student loans originate with the government, the government would just sort of write off the debt. Right. And uh, that was part of the bailouts. Uh, and the for benefit, the if that were to happen, would be economically uh, a boon. Right. Because right. now, instead of having to worry about paying back their huge student loans, mm -hmm. that money is freed up, and they become a bigger part of the economy. Correct. Yes. You know, as consumers, student debt is actually larger than credit card debt today, and um, you know, a lot of these students are suffering. They're actually they're they're being raided by SWAT teams. Um, uh, they're they're getting involved in essentially the debt prison complex that's developing, where you know you're stuck in debt for life, and um, it could even be passed on to your family too. Mm. Yeah, death um, does not does not cancel your student debt. Uh, it Is will go right? on. I, I did yeah, if you if you, you mean pass if I away, die and I owe ten thousand dollars. It will, my student loan. Anyone who may have co-signed, they'll go to them. Um, after that, uh, family members. Whether um, or not I sign papers to that effect? As well, a no, once I you understand, but not yeah, if, if it's no, I believe if you co-sign, right? Yeah, oh, well, if okay. you co-sign, yes, yeah, if you okay. co-sign. Uh, but, you know, family members, uh, you know, will inherit that debt as well. And the thing with uh, student loans, um, you know, very, very nasty. Um, it, um, if you go into default, um, I think default would happen if you don't make payment for maybe six months about that. Okay. Um, after that, you know, they can garnish your wages, um, take away tax refunds. Um, if you're on Social Security, uh, they can uh, garnish your Social Security uh, benefits up to 30%. Um, so for somebody who makes less than 1500 um, a month on Social Security, you know, taking 30% of that. Um, you're you're taking away their livelihood and and really um, chances for them to even go further to you know find proper work to attempt to still attempt to pay it off. Um, it's just it's a vicious cycle. Um, so the, the hole way, just keeps getting bigger. It does, and it, it you know it's it's not helping anyone. Um, and the only people who are winning um, are the um, the big is the big money that right. you know created these these debts. Um, and it just, you know, it just. Do you believe she's squashes. making any headway in reaching people to understand her concept oh, sure. and, and what it's going to, the benefit of it? Sure. I mean, there are some people who are skeptical. Uh, there are some people who are saying, no, absolutely no way. Um, but there's a whole generation of young people um, who are like, yes, absolutely, I am ready for this. Um, and uh, they, they definitely back her. Um, and then, of course, there are some people who, are, who work in financial fields who are like, yeah, you know what, her solution does make sense. Um, so I think um, that that is one of the biggest um, and one of the most important uh, parts of her platform. Form. Okay, and, mm -hmm. and in terms of the economic effect as young kids uh, have these debts eliminated, they're more apt to now look 
to maybe they can afford to buy a house, right. uh, buy a car, right. uh, things that are going to help the inter internal co economy of the United States. Yeah, they, because they can be everybody, in, again. yeah, everybody in the society is a consumer and a consumer. Everybody has two roles. Sure. We're so mm -hmm. used to thinking of ourselves just as consumers. Yeah, the thing about this is too. I, I used to see it as, geez, these kids are already mortgaged before they own a house. But it's even worse than that because. You know, if you if you if it's a question of a mortgage and a piece of property, you know, you can always declare bankruptcy, and then you'll wind up losing the house. But you can't declare can't bankruptcy, that, yeah. which you get reduced to as an indentured servant. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a good thing there's no more debtors' prisons. Huh? Well, and no, they want to keep you out of prison so you can keep on paying the interest rates. So it's it's, uh, and then if they wanted to, they could they could raise them. It's it's a dangerous, horrible situation. It really is. But Jill Stein, I think she commented that there are so many students and young people that according to this trap that if she had gotten the, if she gets their votes, she can conceivably win the election. Yes. That's how yeah. great yeah, that number that. Yeah. of uh, people are. Would those be considered Bernie supporters who've wanted uh, his programs in terms of uh, eliminating the uh, the college debt. Do you think he's sh she's making inroads with that segment of the population? Well, we've seen it when we're collecting signatures. Sure. As soon as he mentioned that there's a prospect to eliminate debt, not just simply um, make higher education, public education free, which both Bernie Sanders and Jill Stein support, right. um, that definitely turns people's heads. And you know the idea of, um, and I think this goes to the heart of why the Democrats and Republicans don't want her in a debate, um, because she had that lawsuit against the Commission on Presidential Debates, and uh, it got thrown out. But Mitt Romney and President Obama, they personally had the case thrown out. They th themselves, because they were involved in the debates, they had it thrown out. It wasn't just the commission itself. Is that she's going to bring up options, possibilities that they're going to have to be forced to respond to because. Um, ideas outside of the duopoly raise the standards of what the public expects from anybody in office, and there are going to be lines of questioning the in inquiry that the mainstream politicians don't want to deal with. Okay, sure. So, from the debt to economics to jobs and outsourcing, mm -hmm. the, the connection there, if there is money for uh, jobs being created here we can eliminate outsourcing of jobs and create jobs that will create a stronger middle class. Mm -hmm. So where, where is she going to be in terms of the outsourcing issue that we hear so much about? Uh, well, as I was saying during the first session, a lot of her solutions are interconnected with uh, solutions to other problems. So for instance, this dovetails uh, very much with the issue of undocumented immigration. A lot of these people are coming from other countries. They're fleeing because their economies have been compromised by um, U.S. corporations and corporations from other Western countries taking over and subverting their economy so they no longer really have any autonomy. They can't make a decent livelihood. So they end up fleeing to the country that is a source of their problems. So it's not really an issue of so-called illegal immigration. It's a question of what should be illegal or more heavily regulated corporate emigration because they're always looking for the, the cheapest source of labor. And if it brings things down for them, it's going to bring things down for us here. And that is definitely what's happening. Um, for instance, um, Pfizer in Connecticut, I, I don't remember. I think it's maybe Mystic. I don't remember which town in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. They actually um, they replaced their entire staff. Uh, they, they used H-1B, I think it's called H-1B visas, um, and they brought in uh, employees, I believe, from India. They had to train their own replacements, and they were willing to work for one-third the pay with no benefits. The and folks from India? I believe they were, yeah, it was employees from India. for a third of what the yeah, they come established to the, yeah. employees. Now, the idea of the H-1B visa was introduced, I believe, to the State Department for the purpose of just sort of having um, cross-fertilization about how different businesses operate in different parts of the world. So they're not supposed to be used in this way to actually replace American workers. And another example, which is really kind of strange, is um, 
uh, Gibson Guitar is a famous guitar manufacturer sure. in the United States. They had two factories in, in the South. I, I don't remember if it was Kentucky or West Virginia. And twice the factories were raided and shut down. All the employees were told to go home because uh, the company was charged with illegally sourcing uh, wood from Madagascar for the manufacture of their instruments. And uh, so the case came to trial, and um, the company was able to prove, no, we got these materials pr pr uh, through you know, totally appropriate channels. And somebody on the part of the government actually approached the uh, president of the company and was saying, you know, if you just simply outsource your company labor to Madagascar instead of hiring people here in the United States, all your problems are going to go away. So the solution from the government person yeah. was to go to take They're your encouraging this. Yes. Yeah. And yes. that way if you use the resources of Madagascar, hey, you're, you're there. What are you going to do? Right. I mean, that's, yeah. pretty, mm -hmm. that's pretty low. Trying to like entice them. But like, oh, okay, you didn't use sure. materials from Madagascar. Mm -hmm. You want to? Yeah. yeah. Um, that, uh, it's not going to cost you that much in terms of labor. Right. Yeah. Right. So, that's the yeah. other uh, connection. Sure. I mean, we, we're beset with this idea. We, we live in Connecticut. Connecticut is very one of these big corporate towns in the state, and. Stanford. St I mean, I'm in Stanford, yeah. <laughs> and um, okay. we're constantly being railed with this idea that life is impossible unless we give some sort of concession to UBS or RBS or some big hedge fund. Tax write-offs. And, yeah, and they're always playing games. We, the city is forced to spend a lot of money, then they up and leave because they don't like something. Um, GE being the latest. Yeah, GE, right. There's, yeah. A, there's a good example. But nobody stops to think, well, if these companies are so valuable, they're so great, where do they come from? You know, why can't we start our own enterprises locally? Stanford is used to actually manufacture its own automobiles like in the late 1800s, early 1900s. I don't know if it was electric or steam. They called it the Stamobile. And, um, you know, I was running for local office in Fairfield County. That was an example I like to use to say we have to get back to that local level of enterprise. And the problem with these politicians is they're always saying, well, we support small businesses, but people have different definitions of a small business. They have a different idea in their head of what a small business is compared with what, say, the Labor Department says. You can have a small business and it can have as many as 150 to 250 people, depending on whether you're, you know, a big company or manufacturing. Right. Retailer. Yeah. So that has a bigger put footprint on influence, local politics, and so on versus somebody, you know, everybody thinks of a small business like the local hardware store, like 11 people or something like that. So they can technically say, yeah, they're supporting small businesses, but they're supporting enterprises that can really influence things to favor, favor everything in their direction. So those two definitions have to be more consistent. You okay. know. Well, and Jill Stein, again, uh, promises at this point that things will change under her leadership by addressing these issues head on. Mm -hmm. Not going around them or skirting well, them. Well, it, she's mm -hmm. she's against the the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership because once again, um, the uh, feeling is that that particular trade agreement would be worse than NAFTA in terms of um, pulling jobs uh, out of the country and uh, e exploiting labor. And then, as you said, uh, it it just simply forces. Uh, uh, immigration uh, in, into areas that uh, uh, appear to be uh, more uh, more uh, accessible to jobs. Well, but so the immigration <coughs> issue is not just one of, of uh, looking for a better job because you mentioned India being uh, a place where they brought in employees to work at a third of the rate, but they were English-speaking mm -hmm. individuals, I would think, mm -hmm. which made it easier for them to transition into those jobs. I don't see that they would be importing folks from Central America or South America who had no English skills. Right, yeah. So the language also is enticing for them because mm -hmm. it's easier to, and India may be uh, more educated uh, than some of the other uh, countries. Yeah, yeah that example I cited, those are essentially white collar jobs. Mm -hmm. And the problem is people in the, in the middle class, they, you know, they're not realizing that the, the issue about jobs and immigration and so on is not just people working 
in say a maquiladoro in South or Central America versus being um, working uh, for some corporate farm in the United States or something like that, it is going to affect everybody eventually. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, we just uh, what Jill Stein represents is a more convivial, mutually supportive type of economic uh, foundation rather than one that's just based on exploit and exploitation and constantly so-called growing the economy. It's like you don't need to grow, a healthy economy doesn't grow, there's like a cancer cell. What you need is an economy that, you know, you take the currency that you use, the dollar, and make sure it cycles as much as possible within a given area between producers and consumers before it leaves the area. Um, and that, that's, you know, we were talking before in the break about um, credit unions. Yeah. And um, that's a good example of, you know, the value of having a localized economy is to make people's situation better. More people actually got their homes, their first homes, they got their mortgages through credit unions rather than commercial banks after World War II. Mm -hmm. And now the commercial banking sector, I read a couple of years ago, they want to marginalize how much of a role they have in the economy because after what happened in 2008, more and more people started putting their money in credit unions. And I'm a member of one. It was founded by high school teachers at Stanford High back in the 30s. And, um, you know, it's... Uh, it's an alternative that n not many in the public are aware of or they don't know how to access right, yeah. uh, membership into a credit union, although I think credit unions are trying to uh, advertise more that they're out there, they're yeah. that they are uh, better than Mm -hmm. banks to a large degree and technologically they're right there with them. Yeah, I mean the access issue, I wasn't able to join my credit union um, until they changed their hours and I was actually able to go there, you know, you know, because um, I worked in Norwalk and I was living in Stanford. And it was just one location? Yeah, well there's there's one, there's there's another one and it's the in Fairfield, it used to be called the Fairfield County Federal Credit Union. Now it's called Cornerstone Credit Union, but it was just two branches. Yeah, right. one was so in as an effect, which we discussed during the break, was the bigger credit unions were basically taking over the smaller credit unions, mm -hmm. and eventually, what has happened is that more locations were created because of certain mergers. So now, if you live in Stanford, mm -hmm. you may be able to go to maybe, uh, what's the nearest town? Would like is Norwalk, Norwalk yeah. within reason? That'd be, yeah, that'd be or great. Or you could travel to yeah. Norwalk. Mm -hmm. Your credit union is there, or New Haven. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, accessibility mm -hmm. definitely is important for yeah. anybody especially when it pertains to their money. Right. You know, and, so, um, and the thing is that more people support it, the more, the greater their ability it is to expand like that. Um, and what Jill Stein is talking about, you know, these issue about the spoiler argument or you don't have a chance of winning is like, it cracks me up. It's like the last, what, couple of weeks or something, the media, they've been dredging up anything they can yeah. to attack her. Mm. And it's like, I realize this is really flattering because that means she's getting attention. So now they, now they- She's getting they, under their skin. Yeah, oh, so yeah. now there was one story about how somebody, a reporter f saw her in a lobby, a hotel, checking her mirror and looking at her hair. It's like, oh my God, that's the best you can do. And then, then there was a poll <laughs> <You> mean, <laughs> doing that. Yeah, before an interview or something. For, I mean, it's, know, so, being a human it looks, so it's so obvious how desperate this is. Yeah. For, for being human. Yeah, uh, but, the, but the thing is, is that what she's doing is she's trying to encourage people to just you know stand up on their own resources and demand change because you know, historically in any society any any that makes what makes a society any society worth living in is because of populist movements from the bottom up um, and um, uh, have you seen that that Roger Moore movie, uh, Where to Invade Next? Michael Moore. Uh, no, Mike, right, Michael no, Moore. No, 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 it's very interesting because he goes through all these different countries around the world and addresses different um, how they deal with different social issues, education, incarceration, and stuff like that. And um, it's just amazing how many practical solutions are out there. And a lot of these countries, they they explain, well, we got these ideas from the United States in many cases and we've abandoned that. Um, if you go back to the definition, you know, everybody talks about the American dream, um, and everybody assumes it's having a big mansion or a boat or something like that, but it actually means people helping their neighbors. It was coined by a historian in the 1930s, and he said it's not about buying a second car, it's about helping your neighbor. And, and being that's able what it to really be means. happy. Right. Uh, the happiness factor. Mm -hmm. uh, you can only be happy if 
you're able to get a job that helps you pay your bills, that helps you raise your family, mm -hmm. and if you don't have a job, it's pretty hard to be happy. Right. So, well, uh, there, there's a good example of last year, I think it was, a woman that worked at Dunkin' Donuts. Um, she worked at three Dunkin' Donuts stores at the same time. And you went from one shift to another to another, so she hardly ever was at home. So she used to, on her break, she'd go and sleep in her car, and she asphyxiated because there was some gas, a gas great. tank, you know, but she didn't have time even to fill the tank. And um, the head of Dunkin' Donuts is opposed to raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour. And she couldn't make money at one location. She, she had to work at three locations. She had a family. And you know she took care of them the best that she could. But this is the level of desperation being driven to. And Chris Hedges has gone on about instant examples like this. But in particular, what he refers to as sacrifice zones, uh, communities and throughout the United mm -hmm. States that are now just totally been given over to this mentality, like um, uh, Camden, New Jersey. It's like a no man's land. Um, the police are, uh, the, if you wander in there, the police warn you, you know, you enter at your own risk because it's been c totally privatized, totally be given over to a profit motive, and there's no real enterprise there anymore. It used to be a hub for manufacturing. He grew up there, I believe. And um, this is the model, unfortunately, that we're heading towards. We're going to almost certainly see more of this with TPP if it passes because. Um, you know, I, I recently read that uh, Obama is now claiming that it'll create more jobs, like Clinton said under NAFTA. But Obama, when this was first brought to public <coughs> attention, Obama at first denied he had anything to do with it or he wasn't considering f supporting it. Talking about the TPP. TPP, now. yeah. But I believe we first found out about it through WikiLeaks. You know, I, were these people actually planning to pass this thing without us even knowing? Right, because, you know, most of Congress doesn't even know about that it. was involved and would be involved in voting on it. Yeah. I mean, and it, they couldn't it, be recorded. They couldn't bring right, notebooks yeah. into the sessions. Um, it, was, it was that private. Well, it's um, a corporate project. And, you know, unfortunately, Obama, he's a corporate president. Mm -hmm. And who knows, uh, you know, he, he can't bite the hand that's been feeding him. Right. And but you were going to talk about fragging as well, were you not? Oh, right, yeah. Um, well, I, I, there's a new book that came out. I, I've, I heard an interview with the author. I haven't had a chance to look at it. It's called um, The Gilded Rage. And it's about a journalist that just interviews people that are really into Donald Trump. And they just frankly are talking about, you know, away from these crazy rallies and all this rank racism and, and drunkenness and so on. He finds out that, you know, these people are just plain tired of suffering and nobody paying attention. So these people, they come from the states where fracking is is affecting the water. You know, it's, it's you know, you've seen the video where somebody opens a tap and a flame comes out when they put a, a, a can a, a gas match land, to a gas land. Yeah, <laughs> gas land. Um, and we ha we've had people from uh, come to Stanford protest UBS as financing of um, mountaintop, removal. mountaintop removal. And <clears throat> um, they've tapered it down a bit. I, I don't know if they're completely out of it. But these are places where the quality of life is just plummeted because of um, all this industrialized extraction of resources from the earth. And it's, you know, things like fracking, um, tar sands, and so on. These are indicators that we're actually reaching the bottom of the battle barrel regarding uh, um, petroleum as an energy source. You know. And the effect on the climate. Yeah. Uh, so, um, and then, of course, as I mentioned before, outsourcing. Um, uh, th there's another author I've read. He used to run a blog, and he used to be a writer for military history mag magazines. His name was Joe Bajet, I think the last name is pronounced. He actually grew up in the same area as uh, Lindy Eglin, the one that was involved in that scandal in Abu Ghraib. Okay. And um, he was, he, he, the book was called uh, Deer Hunting with Jesus. And, you know, it's, it's you know it, he talks about the lives yeah he, he talks about the lives of people in these rural areas you know of course gun culture is very important people are very religious and how they're struggling to get by and how these corporate interests these banks they just totally exploit them reduce their expectations and this is i think where a lot of the trump support mm -hmm. is coming from these proverbial flyover states and people on the coast just don't really understand it and you know trump is of course appealing to that sense of rage so, it's all about the rage there. Yeah, you know, so. There's a lot of rage. There's, uh, you know, the, the apparently government's not working for people. Mm -hmm. um, corporations are exploiting people. Uh, students are being reduced to indentured servants. 
Uh, it's just, you know, the, it's, it's, uh, it's a boiling pot. Sure, and it's hard for, I'm sure, Ms. Stein, as a healer, uh, as someone who wants to unite to see all this going on and her uh, efforts to make inroads are being thwarted uh, a bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, her being able to be at the debates, uh, I think, would be enormous. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. Well, the media is supposed to be the watchdog for the people, but once the media is bought, there's nothing there. It's really, it's tough. It's tough to uh, liberate the people from uh, a system that's so rigged that the entire democratic process is simply a front uh, for the uh, corporate system. Right, and they continue to divide. It. They, uh, they uh, personally, when when the the words minority and when we divide ourselves, or black, white, I, I, that's in my opinion is divisive. I mean, if we want to say uh, Joe's from Brooklyn, I'm from the Bronx. You know, Brooklyn has a different <coughs> way of making. Uh, a creams versus the Bronx, you know, and we can have a debate about that. Well, but Brooklyn makes a better A cream than the Bronx. You should well, know that. Well, I, I don't know about that. <laughs> but, um, you know, the fact that at this point it's 2016, and we are still being exposed to the color of my skin, not the content of my character. Right, they still do that. They'll say the Hispanic vote, the black vote, you know, uh, the, uh, the, the, the minority vote, they'll do that, you know. That, but We're that, leaving out the human being factor, because right, yeah, yeah. basically, uh, that, I think it was yeah. Bill Nye, the science guy, who said there's one human race, so mm -hmm. we need to get over the fact that, you know, race, the word race is being used in such a it's like a device of it, it is, yeah. The, the race card, it's called. Right. Yeah. Well. Well, hopefully Jill Stein will make a difference, and I appreciate both of you being here today with us. Uh, Cora, R uh, Ralph, Joe, as usual. Uh, this is Progressive Soup, and we'll see you next time. David, we miss you. Have a good night.